and welcome and hi everyone from Poland. Um, so my talk essentially takes a cognitive linguistic and usage-based approach to the evolution of language and kind of asks from a theoretical perspective, kind of what does that look like? And the first starting point is cognitive linguistics, where um, this is nicely captured in the quote from Gilles Fauconnier. One of the key assumptions is that language is only the tip of a spectacular iceberg. And when we engage in any language activity, we draw unconsciously on vast cognitive and cultural resources. And as cognitive linguists, we're interested basically in kind of the things um, under the surface that we can't see, that cognitive mechanisms like learning mechanisms, pattern recognition, categorization, and social cognition. From a usage-based perspective, uh, one of the main assumptions is that constructions are learned in interaction using general cognitive processes, and that basically constructions are abstracted from actual language use in context. And kind of for language acquisition, that means if we have a construction, which is a form meaning pairing, um, that um, in a usage-based view, children use their pattern recognition skills to kind of get into the form side and their intentional understanding skills to get to the meaning side. However, the context here is an important um, thing and the usage-based approach also kind of takes seriously that language acquisition and generally language use takes place in the community. And so basically we're interested in two different kinds of icebergs, namely the iceberg of community and the iceberg of, um, of cognition and what's underneath the surface. And two things that um, we're particularly interested in um, or kind of one um, view I'm taking here is that on the cognitive side, one of the crucial mechanisms um, is entrenchment, and on the community side, uh, one of the crucial um, aspects is conventionalization, and these are um, linked by usage. In this model, um, kind of usage being um, the thing that connects entrenchment and conventionalization also underlies um, the entrenchment and conventionalization model by Hans-Jörg Schmid. And he has a very nice met metaphor um, how to think about the fact that language arises out of the dynamic interaction of usage, conventionalization, and entrenchment. Namely, that language is a bit like a tangling machine named after the um, drawings and especially kind of sculptures um, made by the Swiss artist Jean Tengeli, where you can see that like there's lots of complex kind of um, wheels and um, things interacting with each other in very complex ways. And language is a bit like that. And what we're basically trying to figure out is what all these different kind of wheels do and two of the main wheels that we're interested in are entrenchment and conventionalization. So what are entrenchment and conventionalization in this model? Entrenchment refers to the fact that repeated encounters, repeated encounters of the structure in language use, on the one hand, impact the cognitive encoding and storage of these structures, and also strengthen the representation of these structures in memory. So what that means is that basically, um, if we have a network of constructions in our um, minds slash brains, and they have various connections with each other through repetition, um, certain connections get strengthened. Um, Dagmar Didiak in her um, 2019 book um, further delineates different types of entrenchment and basically has three key messages about entrenchment and how it functions cognitively. One is that what you do often, you do faster and with fewer errors. So this relates to processes of automatization and routinization of language units. Basically, you become more fluent, more accurate, and it's easier to retrieve linguistic units. Then units that occur together refer together and achieve a unit status. And you can see that most clearly in idioms. So things like kick the bucket, but even frequent collocations like brush your teeth, for example, have some kind of unit status. And lastly, units that occur together blur together. 
And this re um, refers to cognitive processes of chunking and fusion, where basically separate um, linguistic items become chunked into one. And you can see that, for example, in the fact that I don't know, um, basically cognitively has become the know, or going to has become gonna. Now, this is the cognitive side. What about the community side, the so conventionalization? Convention, um, as Greg Mills in his talk reminded us, is an arbitrary self-perpetuating solution to a recurring coordination problem. And it's basically a process. And then the process of conventionalization is a process in which communities of interacting agents establish and readapt regularities in their communicative behaviors. So the repetition of usage activities during usage events leads to conventionalization. And it's essentially continuous mutual matching and coordination of communicative practices and knowledge. Conventionalization, importantly, is a matter of degree. And Schmidt talks, for example, about usualization and diffusion as kind of subcategories of conventionalization. So before, when you have a kind of a communicative routine, before it becomes completely conventionalized, it first becomes usualized, so more common in the community and parts of the community, and then it diffuses across the community to become conventionalized. Now, what is the role of processes of entrenchment and conventionalization in language evolution? Um, the kind of theoretical proposal that I'm looking into is that entrenchment and conventionalization have the potential to explain aspects of the emergence of proto-language and the gradual transition to fully-fledged language. Now, on a classical kind of biologically based genetic view of how we got from proto-language to language, um, biological evolution is the thing that plays the biggest role. So proto-language is like a pre-language stage, putatively used by early hominins, and then language is in kind of the usage-based view, um, a structured inventory of conventionalized entrenched for meaning pairings of varying degrees of schematicity. However, um, especially kind of more cognitive functional approaches have also stressed um, the fact that the transition from proto-language to language was not only something that happened on a phylogenetic level, but also on a diachronic level. So that we have processes basically in historical time, cultural evolution that led from proto-language to language and processes of entrenchment and conventionalization um, are thought to play an important role there. But they also play a role in um, kind of figuring out how proto-language emerged in the first place. And for that, I'm introducing another time scale on level, and that's the enchronic time scale, which is the time scale of interaction in the moment. So in, on the enchronic level, we basically have a communicative unit and then we have social interactive processes operating in conversational time, leading to online structure. And this is something that is stressed in interactional usage-based approaches. So these look at the emergence of grammatical patterning in online production, dialogically, and there's a cooperative achievement. So the question is, how does structure emerge in interaction? And things that are having proposed are processes like alignment, stance taking, structure building, and dialogic syntax is one particular area that focuses on this question that I want to talk a bit um, about in some more detail. So dialogic syntax is concerned with the online features of grammatical structure building. So it looks at how speakers align and co-construct structures in their utterances based on patterns of utterances of their interlocutors. So the second speaker very often selectively reproduces linguistic structures and functional and conceptual aspects invoked by the first speaker. And this is captured in the concept of resonance in dialogic syntax. Um, here we have, um, for example, corpus data where um, Joanne says, it's kind of like you, Ken. And then Ken says, that's not at all like me, Joanne. And we see kind of a mirroring um, of these structures here. And so we have kind of an emergence of a kind of online structure where the second speaker kind of changes certain things to express their stance. 
to give you some more examples that this is also related to meaning. So here, Dren says, yes, he's still healthy. He reminds me of my brother. And then Lenore says, he's still walking around. I don't know how healthy he is. So here we have basically um, an isomorphism between yet yeah, he's still healthy and he's still walking around. And here healthy and walking around are put into contrast. And that means that walking around, which normally has the meaning of kind of, you know, just walking around here um, gets kind of gets the contextual meaning of not really healthy, but at least not dead. Um, Resonance also has um, a social function of affiliation, and you can see that in this example here of uh, two preschool girls interacting with each other, and the first one says, All right, um, so what you, what you see here is that the, the first child says, did you know my babysitter called Amber had already contacts? Um, and the second child mirrors this with my babysitter called Amber and in that kind of structure, in that slot of the online structure, she inserts my mum. And then she reproduces um, this kind of odd syntactic structure with had already, and then contacts, and then she adds um, new information. And here we see basically how online structure gets repeated and modified by interlocutors. Um, and if you don't get the, the same at the end, it's like a child who is asking, oh, what, like, your mum and dad, are they wearing the same set of contacts or do they share contacts? Um, and then find it hilarious. Okay. Michel, sorry for the yeah. minute interruption. Just so you know, there was no sound audible ah, for us. Okay. All right. Um, thanks for informing me. Let's see if I can change that. Or not. Oh, okay, in that case, um, you get you get the drift. So child one says, did you know my babysitter called Amber had already contacts? And child two says, my mom has already contacts and my dad does too. And then you see this brief um, minute where she, she thinks about it and she laughs. And then she asks, the same? Okay, all right, sorry that didn't work, um, but you get the, the picture. Um, so this process of how structure basically emerges in interactions um, has been called ad hoc constructionalizations. Um, and essentially this then, opens the way to interactional cognitive linguistics and a dialogic construction grammar. And this has been proposed by Adrian Brone and Elizabeth Zima. So they focus on how speakers in an ongoing direction jointly set up local construction routines with varying degrees of flexibility and fixedness. So the focus here is not on community-wide conventionalizations, but on ad hoc constructions that are temporary routines set up as part of a conceptual pact between speakers in an ongoing interaction. Um, this is also something that is um, looked at in experimental semiotics. So um, in the classical maze game task where kind of players have to converge on a shared location, but they can't see where the other person is. Um, you see this, um, Kind of, and they communicate a chat box. You know, the extreme right is one box. Here, right, the extreme right is sticking out like a sore thumb. So we see one kind of conceptualization here. 
that's where I am. It's like a right indicator. Yes, and where are you? Well, I'm a, that right indicator you've got. Yes, the right indicator above that. So here, basically, um, both agents or both players converge on a shared um, referring expression right indicator um, online. So this becomes basically a micro convention. Um, there's also interesting work showing that you um, had the, these kinds of conventions quite early. So in a nice study by Manfred Born and colleagues, they had um, two children in separate rooms communicate concepts to each other just by using their bodies so they couldn't speak to each other. And these also um, became, convention, um, became um, conventionalized um, across the diet. So bicycle, for example, um, you see two different types of um, solutions that different pairs found. So one kind of um, is standing up and doing like the, the bicycle movement and the other kind of lying on the ground and doing bicycle movements. And the interesting thing is that then in the more frequently they use this, um, it also became schematized. So with the bicycle movement again, um, it started out with whole body movement, but then changed into like just a single hand movement. So here again, we see that basically we have um, shared conventions, um, kind of or micro conventions emerge for interactional time, and then these also become schematized. So the when the proposal is that. Basically, we have these emergent local constructional routines. So the, uh, these are locally emergent and adapted to the temporary unfolding contingencies within evolving structures of talk. And then we have the process of ad hoc constructionalization leading to something like a local constructicon, so um, local network of form meaning pairings that are kind of cognitively available for both um, interactants. So these are productive local grammatical templates with varying degrees of lexical fixedness and variability shared by um, interlocutors. And then we have processes like micro entrenchment, local schematization and routinization, conceptual pacts, interactive alignment, structural priming, and things like repair, transparency, selection, um, that all are factors that influence how um, structures become um, micro entrenched on the cognitive side and kind of micro conventionalized on the community side. Um, what this means is um, for kind of a more general view is that grammar can be seen as an emergent phenomenon that is built and co-constructed in dialogic interaction between interlocutors. Um, this is captured in the fact that today's syntax is yesterday's discourse. On the entrenchment side, frequent reoccurrence leads to the strengthening of memory traces of processing events and increasing degrees of entrenchment. On the conventionalizing side, constructions emerge in interaction, um, stabilize and become more structured within an interactional community. Now, the interesting proposal that I'm um, going to skim over is that basically it, what happens on the cognitive and the social processes that happen on this micro level are basically the same that happen on the diachronic or kind of long, longer term levels. And that means that kind of processes in language acquisition, processes in grammaticalization, and processes like in the emergence of online structure are all relevant for how structure emerges generally, also in cultural evolution. So the this gives us an insight into the question also, how did the first proto-constructions emerge and how did proto-constructions turn into constructions and give rise to constructicons, so a network of constructions. So the picture basically is that we have emergent proto-constructions um, and then we have a process of constructionalization leading to a constructicon. And this happens both on the enchronic and the diachronic time frame. So in conclusion, um, temporary emergent communicative routines turned into an inventory of entrenched community-wide communicative routines, proto-language, and these then evolved into a fully grammaticalized and conventionalized structure inventory of constructions shared by a community language. 
And so the general proposal is that entrenchment, conventionalization, the enchronic dimension, concepts like ad hoc constructionalization, processes of online structure building, um, are all missing links between proto-language and modern language, and also for how we got proto-language in the first place. And um, that's the kind of the, the model to be fleshed out. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention.